What they did at that meeting, and the reason it's important for us, was that they called for a couple of months later for the first Virginia Convention, which was to be held in Williamsburg on the 1st of August. And when they did that, they said to these mostly members of the House of Burgess who were assembled to form this association, go back to your respective counties and cities and call for the freeholders, the men who own property, who were the only people who voted at that period of time, collect their sense. In other words, talk to the people back home and have them write something down that we can use. That initiated the process of making resolves and resolutions. The two words are used more or less interchangeably. And that began that process. And as I say down at the bottom, these were the first actual manifestations of independent Virginia political authority. So resolves making immediately became a Virginia habit. I explain this so that when we get to November at Hockingport, Virginians have been used for six months for making resolves. So it's not a surprise that they take resolves. Next one. Here's the Raleigh Tavern in uh, the, the Apollo Room in uh, Williamsburg. And I say here that the Virginians' path to defiance of England and independence began there on the evening of the 27th of May, 1774. Next one. So, these are the first, what I call the first wave of Virginia resolutions. They come between 1st of June and the 4th of August. Remember, we're going for the convention on August the 1st. They were made by 40, that's a lot, isn't it? 40 out of 65 of the political jurisdictions take them. It's hard to summarize 40 documents in three bullets, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Many venture, we're going to risk our lives and fortunes. So many of them express support for, for the Bostonians. There's one marvelous one which says, now's the time for the man with his hatchet and his tomahawk to go to the aid of our brethren in Boston. Kind of a nice line. Many said, venal all English uh, ministers. Many condemned acts of parliament, because we're at the end of this long period of the Townsend Acts and so on, leading up to the, to the revolution, and taxation without representation. Some of them are really quite tough. Next one. The Fairfax County Resolves are really a strong document. Seven pages, George Washington and George Mason, the principal authors. But they are really tough. Jeff Broadwater, historian, calls them the most detailed, most influential, and most radical of the Resolves. Turns out what's going to happen at Hockingport is really quite bland compared to this kind of stuff. But the Virginians are in this period of making Resolves. Next one. Meanwhile, the, the Bostonians, the New Englanders, are also making resolves. And so I need to tell you a little bit about the Southern results. Southern's an English county, but it was also a former county which included Boston. So it was a big former New England county, Massachusetts county. And it voted its results on the 9th of September. They made strong defiance to British authority. And here's a fellow you might have heard of, Paul Revere carried those results to Philadelphia to the First Continental Congress. That was his first ride. I didn't know this until I studied this history. And very importantly, the first ever Continental Congress endorsed the Suffolk Resolves. Now, it's going to be important later, but the Continental Congress met from the beginning of September to the end of October. Our date, looking ahead, our date is going to be the 5th of November. So what happens at Fort Gower comes right after the closing down of the First Continental Congress. Next one. So, Lord Dunmore, central figure in this drama. He, he was only a short term of uh, Virginia's governor. He was a Scotsman. I learned reading recently that he started out as a revolutionary Scotsman. He was a page boy to Bonnie Prince Charlie in the, 18, in the 1745 uh, invasion of England. Didn't, didn't know that until I read about it recently. And in the midst of this political turmoil, Dunmore left Williamsburg for a five-month campaign here in Ohio. Complicated, no simple reason why he did that. Land, suppressing Indians, a lot of complications. I wrote that I think he was probably just fed up being in Williamsburg with all those darn revolutionary Virginians and he was <laughs> pleased to get out of town for a while. <laughs> that's just my opinion. And his fighting men were mainly the riflemen. That's a huge story. Rifles are going to be a huge part of our story. 
from the Western Virginia counties. I'll show you a map in a minute. So he was gone for five months out here. Next one. So here's a little bit of a, of a map which shows you. You see Williamsburg, Virginia. Obviously, Virginia was all one state. I've just divided it so you can see where modern West Virginia is, but that doesn't happen until uh, 70 years after our period. Point Pleasant, many of you know where that is, where there's going to be a big fight. And uh, my good friend Lance Rep points out that I probably got four gowns a little bit too far north there, but you get the general idea. This is only the locator map. And way out in central Ohio is Camp Charlotte. Charlotte was, was Dunmore's wife, and that's where he's going to force the treaty on the Indians. That's near Circleville, uh, Ohio, right out in the middle of those wonderful fields. So, two reasons. One, we're going to suppress the Ohio Indians, we stop them attacking our Virginia borders, and we're going to get Western land. But it's a complicated story. That's only really part of it. Next one. So, Dunmore's army marched in two wings. It's coming from, in the north, it's from what's Dunmore and Frederick counties, because we don't have a Dunmore County anymore. We won the revolution, so it's now Shenandoah County. But it used to be Dunmore's County for a while. And in the south, they came from the, the soldiers, the frontier soldiers, the riflemen, came from Augusta, Bonnetot, and Fincastle. Those are my guys! <laughs> Augusta, Bonnetot, and Fincastle. Those are the southern guys. Now, Dunmore goes up to Pittsburgh and comes down the river. So here's a relatively easy trip. And Andrew Lewis, who leads the southern wing, William Christian and the others, they had to fight their way through the rough country of, of southern West Virginia. So they don't have a very easy ride. Now, they're all supposed to join up. But before they get joined up, the southern wing has got to get Point Pleasant. Cornstalk rallies the Ohio Indians, and they jump the southern wing of the army. And that turns out to be probably still to this day the biggest ever fight between American Indians and, and quote, quote, white people at Point Pleasant. Next one. Now, I'm going to do an interpolation. And if you haven't been to Point Pleasant, go there, okay? Because when I was there in 2009, they were painting murals on the outside of the flood wall at Point Pleasant. And so there are a whole series of, I don't know, 50 murals along the outside of the wall. And I'm going to show you pictures of what happened at Fort Gala from these murals. Next one. This first is the Battle of Point Pleasant. <clears throat> Fort there at Point Pleasant, and you should go there. And I want to point out, you can see this fellow in the foreground, the long rifle and the fringed hunting shirt. Those become two very powerful elements in our story, and I'm going to argue that those are two incredibly important elements for American history. You notice I said American history, not local history, for American history. So that's, that's the Battle of Point Pleasant. And then, after this is, when this is being fought, Dalmore is further north, at Hocking Point, next one, and there is where I slept. Thank you, Lance and Kathy. That's where I slept last night. Right around, I think it was right around this boat. <laughs> okay. So what we're doing is we're looking down river now. On the left is the Ohio, and this is the Hawk Hawking coming in here. And of course, this is licensed artist reconstruction. So I, you know, I, I can't prove that's exactly right. But here we are, and if you look here, on this one I left the stone wall. This is about 10 feet high. So this is on the flood wall. So that's actually what I say supplying. They're unloading the boats that they brought down from Pittsburgh. And in the next one, there they are building Fort Gala. So here we are, right at the point of those two rivers. There's a hocking and then so on. And I don't think, the artists didn't know anymore better than I know where it was. We think it's probably now out under, under the river, maybe 100 yards, because the river's way up from, from where it was in 1774, so that the, the fort is, is probably, the site of the fort is actually underwater. Although we, nobody knows for a fact, nobody knows exactly where it is. Next one. So that's the four pictures I have, or the pictures I have of Fort Gow for you. And so what happened after Point Pleasant? So Dunmore's wing marches out to Circleville, out to south of Columbus, and Lewis's wing joins him. And they're not a, Lewis's wing is not a happy camper. Andrew Lewis is extremely angry. 
His brother has been killed at the Battle of Point Pleasant. He's not very happy that Dunmore didn't give him better support. So there, was, there were actually some stories that Dunmore had to be defended by, by the officers against the southern wing because they were hacked off by the fact that they'd been jumped at Point Pleasant. In any event, the treaty, they, they meet at Camp Charlotte and they impose this treaty on the Indians, which basically says, you guys will be good. They take hostages, they send hostages back to Williamsburg, and they say, we're going to have access to land out here, and you Indians are not going to give us any, any further trouble. So that really breaks the power. This is the moment in which the Indian power in central Ohio is broken. And then they all go back, both wings of the army, go back to Fort Cower on November the 5th. And now it really happens. Next one. Top quote is Daniel Morgan, the rifleman of the revolution. I've got guys who live in North Carolina who will argue with you that America would not be America unless Daniel Morgan had figured out how to use his riflemen and cowpens and beat the English. And there are some historians who say that it's a straight road from cowpens to um, Yorktown and the British defeat in the English surrender. That's how important Daniel Morgan is. He says, at the mouth, this is him writing to Regent Henry Lee. Now this is 25 years after the event. At the mouth of the Hawk Hawking on the Ohio, we as an army, on hearing the news from Philadelphia, you know what had just happened in Philadelphia? The first Continental Congress had just met. And the Continental Congress has said, everybody in America, they took the, the practice from Virginia and Massachusetts, everybody in America is now supposed to make resolves. And so the first people, under the authority of the, of the First Continental Congress, the first people to make resolves are the officers of this army. So when he says, we've dissolved and formed ourselves into a society, that's an independent political body to make American policy. Right there, and you are home. <laughs> we also hear this. This is Harry Ward, who's a good friend of mine. I'm going to be seeing him in about three weeks. Harry Ward wrote, He's the only, only, only professional historian who understands the importance of Fort Gow. He wrote, at Fort Gow, the Virginians undoubtedly learned of the action of the First Continental Congress, particularly, they, had, they learned about the actions of the First Continental Congress, and particularly they learned about the Suffolk results. They knew about Virginia results, they've been making them up for five months. But they also learned about the adoption by that, of, of those results. Next one. So here's Hawking Park four years ago. And I drove into hockey board looking for Fort Gower, and you can't find any evidence of Fort Gower. So I'm driving around, driving around, and finally, I see this sign. And this is Lance, who's here with us today. And, and I see this sign, it says, Fort Gower resurrected 2008. That's when he built this pole building at the back of his house. So I'm banging on doors. <laughs> And finally, finally I get to Lance and I say, where's Fort Gow? And Lance is a student of Fort Gow and he has a wonderful scrapbook and we spend a lot of time, maybe an hour, two hours together, and he loaned me his scrapbook so this is how I finally figured out. And he said, there is another marker downtown at the store. You know, downtown Hockingport is only about 200 yards away. It's not very far away. So here is the DAR marker, 1923, Doors of American Revolution, which recognized what? That's it. The only two things are that and that. That's it. Well, as you I have discovered on this trip, the lads have got another side on the other side of his building. So there are actually, there are actually three, three sides on again. And it was a rainy day, and here I'm across the whole copy, and basically that's four gar on the point back there in that trees. Now, no trees today. I got some new, new pictures today. And it's basically, it's a kind of a, of a long-term campground. It's Eddie, Eddie Russell's, David Russell's campground. It's kind of what they call it the Ohio Riviera. That wasn't a term I, I know about, but it's kind of recreational. <coughs> Next one. All right, so this is it. When the Virginians made resolves, their habit was they sent them to Williamsburg to be printed. In the, in the Virginia Gazette. That's, I won't go into the story, but there are several Virginia Gazettes. But that was when you made your resolves, you sent them to Williamsburg and they got printed. We don't have the original document, but what we do have, the date here, is the 22nd of December, and these are the four gal resolves taken from 
the Virginia Gazette, and this is the, Purdy and Dixon just means which one of the versions of the Virginia Gazette it was, or a number of versions of, this one was the one published by Purdy and Dixon. So, obviously you can't read this, but I'll show you a couple of copies of this. This was also quickly reprinted in the Pennsylvania Gazette. Next one. So, a preamble and two results. The important part of this document is the preamble. The two resolves are not really very important. The first resolve pretty much echoes the same political sentiments of all the other Virginia resolves. It is actually not that of an important statement, the first resolve. The second resolve is a real wimpy thing. The second resolve says, we think Lord Douglas brought us all the way here from Virginia. It's really a nice guy. I doubt that they really meant that, but since he was there with them, they, uh, they, they probably felt. So the resolves, the irony is that the foggy resolves are not very important. But boy, this preamble is tough stuff. Next one. I'm just going to read you this from the preamble. We have lived about three months in the woods without any intelligence from Boston or from the delegates of Philadelphia. We are a respectable body, is certain. When it is considered that we can live weeks without bread or salt, we can sleep in the open air without any covering but that of the canopy of heaven, and that our men can march and shoot with any in the known world. Blessed with these talents, let us solemnly engage to one another and to the country in particular that we will use them to no purpose but for the honor and advantage of America in general and of Virginia in particular. This language is picked up. This language inflames the Virginians. Next one. At Fort Gower was, I call them, stealing from Shakespeare, a band of brothers. It is absolutely stunning, the cast of characters who are there. Okay? Daniel Morgan, the rifleman of the revolution, who people argue we would not be an, an independent America had Daniel Morgan not figured out how to win, use a rifle to win battles in the South. Andrew Lewis, the Revolutionary War General, who I show a picture of Andrew Lewis. Uh, he runs Dunmore. A year later, he runs Dunmore out of Virginia. Lewisburg, Virginia, that whole dynasty. William Russell is a Revolutionary War General. Adam Stephen as a Revolutionary War general. William Campbell is a hero of King's Mountain. If it wasn't Daniel Morgan who won the revolution, it was William Campbell and his rifleman at, at King's Mountain who run, won the Southern Campaign, which, which guarantees American independence. George Rogers Clark, that's a name you guys know about. I just bought a map of the old Northwest. George Rogers Clark is there. Matthews becomes twice governor of Georgia. Shaw becomes twice governor of Kentucky. Wood becomes the 11th governor of Virginia. George Schultz, Father Greenbrier County, West Virginia. William Crawford is there, who surveyed, he surveyed the land for uh, Washington right across. Uh, and I should have a picture of your uh, side. Um, Simon, Simon Kennedy, all of these guys. I mean, this is a stunning array of people. All there in your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, you know? Next one. So, are these things important? Yes, next one. William Christian. Patrick Henry made a speech, 23rd of March, 1775, and said, um, give me liberty or give me death. Everybody knows that, right? What did they do next? Nobody knows that. What they did next was they said, we are, we, we, we're going to form a committee and we're going to put this commonwealth into a state of defense. What that meant was we're going to start a Virginia army. They form a committee. William Christian is on that committee to build the first Virginia army to, to, to fight the English. He leaves Fort Gow early and four days. So he's not there to take the resolves, but he, his wife is staying at Scotchtown, which just happens to be the home of Patrick Henry because she just happens to be Patrick Henry's sister. Now, I don't know for a fact, but it's very likely that, that, Patrick, that uh, Christian was sent back to give Patrick Henry the news of what was going on and that the officers were getting very feisty at Fort Gala. So he goes back and on his way he stopped near my house in Blacksburg and what we have good documentary evidence is 
from the documentary History of Dumbo War. He stops at Smithfield Plantation, doesn't find William Price and his out surveying land, and he leaves a letter. He says, we've just done this very important thing out in Ohio, and I'm going to have William Russell send this on to you. And uh, on the 12th, William Russell, general, future general, writes to Preston with a copy of the Fort Gale Resource and says, get those immediately to Patrick Henry. <laughs> so Patrick Henry knows about what's happened at Fort Gale before it ever gets published in the newspaper. That's one connection. Next one. All of the new resolves in the Western counties, so here's Augusta, you're in Augusta, Bonnetown, and I'm in Fincastle. And this is a little Pennsylvania down here. All of these resolves, which come early in the new year, these are now not Virginia resolves. This is not just a Virginia event. These are responding to the first Continental Congress. These are national resolves. They're all strongly influenced by Fort Geller because many of the men who write these resolves were in that band of brothers at Fort Geller. So you can begin to see immediately the influence. Next one. Richard Henry Lee. This is an introduction to the longest slide I have today, and I'll read you the quote. So Adam Stephen was a, this is Harry Ward's wonderful book, a biography of Adam Stephen. It's in this book where he talks about where I, when I read this six years ago, I was just stunned. He talks about the significance of Fort Gale. So I have a few books uh, that, that talks about the significance of Fort Gale. And Stephen and Lee were frequent correspondents. So they were in contact many times. And Lee probably learned about what was going on from Stephen. And he certainly learned about the, the role of the Western Rifleman from uh, Stephen. And Ward, Harry Ward believes that Adam Stephen was actually the author of the Fort Gale Resolves. I, I don't have an opinion about that. He may very well be right. But he, he knows a lot about Stephen's writing. He says he can detect Stephen's language, Stephen's style in the Fort Gale Resolves. Next one. I was spending a little time with this. Remember, Ohio historians are telling me these were not very important. <laughs> That's the context, all right? This is Richard Henry Lee. You remember the movie? My name is Richard Henry Lee. Have you seen him riding around on his horse singing about the revolution? <laughs> He's a pretty important guy. And he writes to his brother and he says, the enclosed clipping published a few days in the Gazette. You know what clipping that was. I just showed it to you, okay? The six frontier counties, I showed you them on the map, <coughs> can produce 6,000 of these men, who from their amazing hardihood and their method of living so long in the woods without carrying provisions with them, and with the exceeding quickness with which they can march to distant parts, and above all, with the dexterity to which they have arrived in using the rifle gun, there is not one of these men who wishes a distance of less than 200 yards or an object larger than an orange. At more than 200 yards, he can hit an orange and every shot is fatal. Now, he's writing this to his brother. What is this? Three, six weeks after Fort Gale, saying, we've got an army, brother. We can win a fight with the English Congress. We've got 6,000 of these guys who can march forever, never need any food, and can kill anybody dead at 200 yards. Amazing. Next one. So these Western men make hunting shirts and rifles, the symbols in Virginia, for the coming revolution. This is, this is Point Pleasant. This is the generic Virginia rifleman at Point Pleasant. Hunting shirt, rifle. This, the second one, is Washington's monument in the Capitol Square in Richmond. Washington's on top of his horse, and he's surrounded by six of his allies and his supporters, and one of them is Andrew Lewis from Western Virginia, there. And then a couple of reenactor guys, uh, one in Petersburg, and this fellow on the right, Malcolm Whitaker, is a good friend of mine, he lives in the Parisburg, and, and reenacting this. And my argument is, that, that these symbols become dramatically important as Virginia goes into the revolution. Next one. Now, in February of, of 6 of 1775, a militia call is when some authority calls for an army to be raised among the populace. So that's the militia. 
and the militias go all the way back to 1200 in England. The Normans were raising militia. So we have 700 years of militia history. Once muskets come in, once firearms come in in the, in the 15th, late 15th, late 16th century, then the call always is for people who are going to be in the militia, they have to come with a bag of balls and gunpowder and a musket. And that goes on for 500 years. And then, in February of 1775, someone, George Mason, says, we are going to call for rifles. That's the first ever mention. Guess where that comes from? Right down the river. <laughs> Just from here, the rifle gun. Men who use them, men who, who can procure rifle guns, should form a company distinguishing our dress with hunting shirts. Because we can breed the British with this weapon. Next one. They all have since a, a quarter of a minute. These were published, the four count results were published in a couple of Eastern papers, but they didn't go anywhere. This is what's called going viral in 1774 and 1775. These are American newspapers, and now you look at the dates. So we're only in January, we're only a month, they're only published on December the 22nd. Within a month, Philadelphia, New Haven, Boston, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Salem, Massachusetts. Now I already told you they were, were in, in Philadelphia. And a couple of months later, they got to kind of cross the Atlantic, okay? And a couple of months later, they're in the Scots Magazine, they're in the Caledonian Mercury, the Leeds Intelligencer, and the Northampton Mercury. And these are just the ones I've been able to document so far. I bet I could double or triple this list with enough time on the computer and, and looking at the newspaper records. This is going viral. Everybody who was anybody knew about the results. And importantly, next one. This is from the Gentleman's Magazine. Now the Gentleman's Magazine, if you were in London and you were important, you read the Gentleman's Magazine. It was kind of like, you know, the Time magazine, and, and it was just the most important political magazine. Reprinted in March, guess where this was written? Right there in your backyard, <laughs> okay. So this was a very, very important document. The four garrisons also from Hockingport are already in the Gentleman's Weekly two months later, a little bit more, a little bit more than two months later. And, Next one, that document was read aloud in this, um, this place in have some government, the like Athens <laughs> County, <yeah. laughs> was read aloud in the House of Lords from Hockingport to Westminster Palace in three months. You tell me that this stuff isn't important, okay? And of course, it's only going to be a month later that we're going to have rifle shooting with muskets of Lexington and Concord. So this is the real world. But when this happens, when Lexington and Concord happen, the Virginians are ready. They've, they've got themselves totally talked into, we can beat the British with our rifles wearing our hunting shirts. Next one. This is my good friend. I hope he's going to be there on Saturday, but he's been a little frail. John Robbins. And this is this book that we're, uh, but you need to sell right here, OK? This really important book about Ohio history. Action on the frontier, including the Fort Garrison's, had a wider impact on developing a defiant spirit against England. Symbolically, a liberty shirt appeared as a badge of loyalty, and the wearer would not only be identified with the best fighters in Virginia, but he would be imitating the custom that began after Fort Garrison in the backwoods communities of the frontier. That's John Robbins, my good friend who lives north of uh, Columbus. Thank you. Next one, Lance. This is James in red. This is kind of a double quote. James Madison, you know how he was president. And, and Reese Isaac, who was a very famous, uh, <laughs> he, was a, he was a very famous, uh, he was actually an Australian, but he wrote famous books about the Virginian history. James Madison. The strength of this colony will lie chiefly in the riflemen of the upland counties of the West with whom we shall have very great numbers. You know what, Madison had been reading the, the Williamsburg, been reading the Virginia Gazette. He knew what was going on. 
and then British science success, the readiness of the gene gentry to identify with the woodsman is indicated in the published recommendation to the Burgesses that they attend the Virginia Assembly in June 1775 wearing what? Wearing hunting shirts. Probably should have been carrying rifles too. And uh, my, my um, delegate, Joe Yost in Blacksburg, youngest member, he's 28, and there's a member of the uh, House of Delegates, and I'm supposed to have lunch with him later this month. And I would say, Joe, the next session, buddy, you're going down there in your hunting shirt. <laughs> next one. <laughs> John Adams. John Adams had never heard about the rifle, so this is John Adams writing to his wife. Congress has voted 10 companies of rifles, it's June of 75. 10 companies of rifles to be sent from Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia to join the army in front of Boston. They are an excellent species of light infantry with a peculiar kind of musket called a rifle which has grooves down the barrel and carries the ball with great exactness to great distances. They are the most accurate marksmen in the world. He'd been reading the fog out results. Next one. <laughs> Here's Harry Ward. What should I say when I go talk to these people? So this is from a couple of years ago. Harry Ward says, emphasize that the results are much different from the other resolutions of the period. Signify that the Virginians are already embodied in the field and ready to employ arms and to fight. So this is the first decision to make war. So what Harry Ward says, right here in Ohio at Hawking Point, the first Virginia decision to make war happens with the Fort Garrett results in the preamble. I regard, Harry, I regard the results as indicating the beginning of the sparks thereof of a U.S. professional army. The petitioners assert themselves essentially as an embodied fraternal brand, already with professional military ability, and that they are ready to engage in battle. And these same men soon form the core of the American army. That's Harry Ward, and I've got now, within the last couple of months, I've acquired Major General Pat Stevens, five generations of U.S. Army people, and I am working on General Stevens to endorse this view that that's where the American Army. He's, he's saying, well, maybe I have to read about this, but it's very interesting, and I'm going to talk about this again in, in July in Richmond, and he and his wife are enthusiastically coming to hear this talk, so I'm going to have Major General Stevens next one. So why are they not better now? I mean, it's a real question, isn't it? I mean, if, if, I'm, if what I've said here is, is real, and it is, I mean, these things ought to be on U.S. stamps out there everywhere. Yes. In Virginia, it's mostly because of bad luck. That's my considered opinion. There's this wonderful seven-volume set called Revolution in Virginia. It is a documentary history of the Revolution. Every known set of resolves is in volume one. Every known set of resolves except one. Guess which one is missing? Fog out. Now, I never knew those editors, but they simply missed it. Then we got to volume seven, and volume seven was supposed to be the catch-all. All the things we missed got to put in volume seven. And I know that editor, that's Brent Tyler, who's a good friend of mine. And I said, Brent, what happened? And he said, I simply missed them. <laughs> <laughs> so they showed me in volume seven, they were missing one. We don't have them in Virginia. So they're not officially a part of Virginia's documentary history. Twice, volume one and volume seven, the Virginians missed it. Next one, ouch. <laughs> How do they get missed in Ohio? And I believe it's a significant part because of the incorrect judgment of the late Ohio historian John Cairn. He wrote a review of that little book I showed you, the book about the, with the Ford and the, and the um, uh, governor. He wrote a review and he said, though printed in some Eastern newspapers, the results had little impact, had little impact on the developing revolutionary movement and have little significance. Oh dear. How wrong, in my view, how wrong can you be? But as I say down here, earlier Ohio historians understood and wrote about Fort Gower and maybe even went a little too far. Next one. So this is, a, what a wonderful name. No, don't know much about him. Evelias Oviet Rand, who wrote a book called um, The History of Ohio, probably should be in your bookstore, The Rise and the Progress of an American State, The History of, of Ohio. And chapter six is entitled The Results 
of Dunmore's War, and on page 129, there's a section called the Declaration of Independence at Fort Gallup. <laughs> now, that's, I think, a little bit over the top, but I hope that I have demonstrated that. It's also a very good account of the Fort Gallup results. Next one. So, in summation, why are these Fort Gallup results so important? First of all, they went viral. In contrast to the to received Ohio historical opinion, they went all over the world. They got read in the House of Lords. They influence the results of the other Virginia Western counties, which are taken under the influence of the First Continental Congress, so they're national acts. They harden Virginia, Eastern Virginia leaders, and they cause some of them to believe that they could actually win a revolution against the strongest military power in the world. They thought they could beat the king with their rifle. They help make the rifle honey shirt, uh, symbols of the revolution. They're notable for that band of brothers, so they rare people who live there, and uh, argued, as Harry Watt suggests, it's where the American army is born, right in your backyard. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> so thank you, and I'll be happy to I'll take questions. Right. This is where Andrew Lewis, the formal union where he got started. Right. And they always claimed that, West Virginia's claimed that uh, the Battle of Point Pleasant really was the first battle of the Revolutionary War, not Lexington and, Con and Concord. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I wonder what you thought of that. Well, I, I, I could give you a three hour answer, but I'll give you a short answer. <laughs> okay. the, I've, I've read a lot about it and thought about that. And that story actually goes back to a lady whose name I can't call, but who was a remarkable lady in the 20s. And she, she was denied being in the DAR. And, and she was a very energetic and a very political lady. And she went to, the, to West Virginia, some senator in West Virginia, and actually got the US Congress to pass an act saying that Point Pleasant was the first battle of the American Revolution so that she could get into the DAR. <laughs> That's the background, I think, to that story. <laughs> I, I, you know, my, for what it's worth, I don't think that Point Pleasant was you know, I don't think it's sensible to call that part of the American Revolution, but it's absolutely critical in the run-up to the revolution, and it's absolutely critical of what happened here in Ohio. But it's a good story. Yes, ma'am. There is a sign of Fort Pleasant. I was just there Sunday, uh, which suggests something like the, yeah. the first shot of the war or whatever, and it also says that that's where Cornstalk was killed. I yes, mean, I didn't know that before. And I think he's buried there. There's a monument to Cornstalk yeah. there. Yeah. But I didn't know about the walls, so I didn't know about the walls. <laughs> <laughs> not the battle, okay. There's a monument to Cornstalk there. Yeah, okay. There's also on the, monu on the monument, if you read it there, it talks about uh, the Virginians saved civilization from the savages. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, since they don't publicize it much anymore. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, there's been a savings and the times have an attitude. Yeah, and it, you, you know, it's one of the things when you, when you read a lot of history, you learn that you just can't go back and, you know, apply, I mean, slavery is a huge issue, you know, you just can't go back and apply our standards to, to a different time. It's, uh, you know, it was a different time, different place. Next one. Well, the militia from the Southwest. The militia from the Southwest. Call them, you call them, you call them his army. They always had friction with, with Dunmore. And so there was friction between Dunmore's portion of the militia and the Andrews people that came and met at. Uh, at, at yeah, there, there are reports that when they were at Camp Charlotte, that the Northern Wing had to station guards around Dunmore's tent so that Andrew Lewis's people didn't get at Dunmore. It was not a. Well, they also <laughs> wanted to continue quelling the Indians, and Dunmore didn't because you didn't mention the. Yeah. The scheming of, between Dunmore and his general. Yeah, I, I, that's a complicated story. I'm not sure I've, I've ultimately made up my mind about that. But certainly Dunmore was ready to quit. And, and Andrew Lewis especially, who was, who was angry, exceedingly angry, because his brother was killed, Andrew Lewis wanted to do much more damage to the Indians. And so that was a very much part of the tension. Yeah, well, there was that, that Dunmore had already negotiated. I, 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 the friction. And I am, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of complicated history. I'm, I have yet to make up my mind about what I think about that. So I, I've read a lot of it, but I haven't 
I haven't come myself to a settled conclusion. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a very good book which I I, I brought a copy out here, um, just published. And Dunmore is a complicated figure in history, and I was never never happy with what I read about Dunmore. In fact, as recently as a year ago, I was saying somebody asked me a question about Dunmore, and I said Dunmore is a very strange figure. He's one of those historical figures that when you read about Dunmore, you learn more about who wrote the book than you do about Dunmore. In other words, Dunmore was many things to many people, and depending which Dunmore you got was who you read. But there's a guy called James David Corbett, who was eight years a student of William and Mary. And his PhD thesis was just published by the University of Virginia Press within the last couple of months. And it's got a really long title. It's basically Dunmore's biography, but it, it goes on for seven lines or something. And, and I read it. And I spent much of the last couple of weekends reading it. And it, for the first time, I think gives a balanced view of the man, and it says he's a complicated man. It's where I got the story of the, um, he was a page for Bonnie Prince Charlie, and, and he says it was complicated times, and it's a complicated story, and you just can't make simple explanations. You've got to understand the period to understand them. And so I, I have, I'm getting closer to making up my mind. But it's a fine book, that's another book. I don't know who I'm talking to, but whoever, that's a, uh, John David Corbett, James David Corbett's book about Dunmore would be a great book to have in your uh,
Flipping channels all around Who was my friend from down the street And he was sitting on a couch He was playing his guitar And he was letting it all hang out And he sang, you can do it too You can do what I'm doing You can put your message on community TV Get yourself some public access You won't hardly have to practice Just believe in what you're saying In your creativity Now with all the foolishness That's going down today There's lots of things that I've been to say